and welcome back. Now, as you can see on my workbench here, we have the ubiquitous AT Tiny in its shield again, because there's some news as the title might suggest. Uh, yes, I've managed to get all six uh, GPIO pins running. And of course there is a caveat with that, a price to pay if you will, but it's a fairly cheap price and it's easy to do. So if you consider that the AT Tiny has only got eight pins, two for which have the power, it means we can use all six for GPIO purposes. Right, let's see how this is done and uh, come back to this when I've explained, well, that at the back there and even this over here. So if we zoom in a little bit on the actual board itself down here and bring this into shot, you can see that this LED is connected to pin one at the top and pin four, which is ground at the bottom. So the pin one right at the top is in fact normally the reset pin. So the question is, how does that all work now? How can we be flashing LED from the reset pin? Now, if you've watched my previous video on this, you'll have caught a little hint that maybe there's something we can do with that. And indeed there is obviously, because it's, it's done there. You can see it working. So it's sort of like reading the end of the book, isn't it? Before we've started. But anyway, you get the idea. Um, so how does this work? And what does it mean for us hobbyist developer type people when we do this? Um, let me show you the code that I'm using here, which is the simplest of simple code just to get that blink sketch running, just to prove, in fact, that pin one was an output. So if I call this up here, here we are. That's the entire piece of code. And all it does is do a double blink. But if you look, it says pin five. OK, so that that pin five there is, of course, well, on physical pin one. I should have obviously used a name here, not this magic number, but uh, coding style aside for one minute. Uh, if we zoom in again just very quickly onto the um, AT Tiny, that little sticker on top that um, I showed you, let's get that out of the way. You can just about make out there that pin one does say pin five. Very, oh, just about there we are. Look, right. So uh, now, the other thing I've noticed on camera is that this LED, which is on the um, expansion board, is quite bright. It's the heartbeat LED. So let's use a very high tech solution again, just like we did last time. And just just put something on that LED because it kind of detracts, doesn't it? So there's our high tech solution, a bit of blue tech. Now you can see the flashing LED a little bit better and it stops confusing the camera. Right, okay, how did we then get this working? And how, more to the point, how did we get that sketch uploaded and working? Well, uploading is not a problem. You can just put this on, load it up, stick your LED into pin one and nothing will happen. Obviously, because pin one, physical pin one, P5, is a reset pin, not a GPIO pin. So let's take you through the steps, what we have to do to get that right. And the keyword here is Fuses. Now, fuses sounds really, really sort of technical, doesn't it? Uh, but the, it's used in all the microcontroller um, chips. You know, when I started off with picks and all that, we had fuses there, and they were a lot more critical to the running of a pick than what the Arduino ever is. So here we have a sketch on the. Uh, this is using the Eclipse, but it's it'll run in the Arduino IED just the same. And as you can see, it's been modified a few times. Uh, it's not my original code by any means. Um, all based on Jeff Kayser's code from a little while ago. And it's been modified several times since by various people. I found it on quite a few sites, various configurations. Now, it's all right having a sketch like this, but of course you need a bit of hardware to support that as well, because what this is actually going to do is write out some fuses to the Tiny. Now, you might say, what is a fuse? Can, can you explain what you mean by fuse? Yes, I can. A fuse is a stored value within the AT Tiny 85 or indeed your Uno or Nano or whatever microcontroller that you're using. And it's a it's a set once and then forget. It won't be overwritten every time you upload a code, right? It uses it's in a special place and the compiler knows it mustn't touch it. So we use the word fuse because it's effectively like burning a fuse, you know, if you burn a fuse so it's unset effectively it's a little bit like that but you can do it thousands of times on the microcontroller so they're called fuses just to set a certain bit pattern and you can find out all you ever need to know and then some by reading the 
ATtiny85 spec sheet or data sheet and it'll tell you all about the fuses most of the time of which we, we just don't want to know about unlike PIC program where you really do have to know about them within the Arduino world we tend to ignore them largely so the only fuse that I'm interested in is whether or not you can reset the chip the ATtiny85 or not if you disable the reset fuse bit setting it's just one bit on a fuse then you can't reset it that is by bringing pin one to ground it will not reset that chip so you're thinking and well the point is when you program an AT tiny 85 to put it into programming mode you must bring pin one to ground and reset the chip exactly Benny yeah I'm coming on to that bit so what happens then if you disable the reset pin so you can no longer reset it how on earth do you program it well the obvious answer is you switch it back on again so it is a reset pin and you can do that as many times as you like and that is if you like the caveat with this entire system you can write your sketch whatever sketch you want with the AT tiny 85 and if you think I am going to use pin p5 as part of that design it's going to be a little bit more awkward to test it out because every time you enable p5 to do something you won't be able to upload a sketch again until you unenable it or disable that in fact reset it back to the way it was when it came out of the factory so that's the only caveat but then again I think for one pin you can probably do a lot of the programming without that or perhaps borrow one of the other pins just for testing and then reset it all back and then go right I'm ready now to test properly with p5 let's set it and uh, well you hope that you're not going to make too many amendments after that so as you can see here this um, sketch um, I've modified it now to sort of put this sort of stuff in here because I wanted to better run it multiple times and switch it on and off that reset pin so let's um, have a go because as you saw a minute ago the reset pin obviously was set to a GPIO which is why it could flash that LED so I want to set it back now to a standard reset pin not a GPIO so I can program it again let's do that next now I was going to go into a little bit of detail about the fuse itself but frankly it's it's too complicated there's no need for us to sort of know that level of information unless of course you intend writing sketches like this all I'm going to say is at this point is that there are three fuses we're interested in the H fuse the L fuse and the extended fuse okay now the only one we're interested in at the moment is the H fuse because that's the one that controls the reset pins behavior whether it's a reset pin or GPIO so that's the only one that this sketch actually does anything with even though it can reset some of the others and does uh, we're just we're just not interested in that it's setting that GPIO pin to an input or reset that we're really interested in so if we just whiz down this code the bits that make any kind of sense whatsoever um, the value up here if you just look at this bit up here look the default value for the H fuse which is DF in hexadecimal obviously that means um, everything is as it comes out of the factory and pin 1 P5 effectively well it's not a P5 is it if, if it's set to a reset function then P5 doesn't really exist as such so out of the factory 0xdf means I want that to be a standard reset so I can upload code to my AT tiny 85 thank you very much great now there is on the web I found a fuse um, well calculator and it's well it's very easy to use and it's a way of what I found out how to set it back to a different value but let's just move on a little bit let's uh, come down here all we're going to say is there we are do we want to set that fuse bit to H fuse the standard one we just looked at or do we want to set it to tra 0x so hex value 5f now 5f means everything as it was out of the factory except for that uh, p5 physical pin 1 I want it to as a GPIO that's what you have to program into the H fuse okay so that, that's it and it's all the rest of it all this is just stuff we don't need to know about and I haven't gone into it that much obviously I've had to amend a few bits down here to get this target value in rather than just constantly resetting it 
and I've added this guff up here just to make it a little bit more usable. But apart from that, I'm not really bothered about it. And it's the same sketch all over the internet. So Jeff, who, who created this originally, Jeff Kayser here, look, he obviously invented this the first time around. It was obviously as good as it needed to get functionally and everybody's used it ever since. Right, how about using it then? We know that the AT, Tiny85 in here is currently set to uh, act as a GPIO pin. We don't want that anymore because we can't load up code if that happens. So let's run that and reset it. Now, whilst I do this, I'm just going to make this window down here a bit bigger so you can see a couple of things going on. Not there's a lot going on, believe me. Just going to make that bigger. Right. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more detail about this board. The AT Tiny is in this diff socket here. Put it in here, facing the right way for a change. God, the number of times I've turned it the wrong way around. We've got power because this LED is on here. That's something I put on. Now, there's a 12 volt supply. Let's switch that on because it tells you up here. Look, it says turn on the 12 volt power. Oh, with an additional slash on the end. We'll sort that out. Right, that's on. So now, in my serial window here, what I want to do, I want to enable the RST pin back to normal. So I'm going to put in a one. So uh, put in one and enter and off it goes. Beep beep. And it's reading the fuses. Now let me um, take the workbench off so you can read it all. So what it says, I'm reading the fuses and look, the H fuse reads as 5F. So it, that means I want it as a GPIO pin. So it comes down here, it writes the H fuse as DF because that's what we wanted. It does some stuff with the L fuse as well, although frankly we could probably dispense with that given what this topic's about. It then reads it again, it goes, oh yes, look, now it's DF, that's fine. Um, and then it goes around the loop again. So now, theoretically, well, and in fact, we'll see, this uh, this AT Tiny 85 has its reset pin set back to normal, so it should be able to upload code again. So I'm going to switch off the 12 volt power supply so we don't drain the battery, swap this chip from in here back into the development shield here and uh, well upload that uh, circuit and you'll see what happens. So here we are then with the chip back in here and as you can see it stopped flashing because that P5 um, well isn't a P5 anymore is it? It's a reset pin now and in fact uh, I don't think we're going to be able to program it with it stuck in there. So we'll just take that out for now and uh, bring up the very simple sketch we had before which is that one there. So that's the one. So that's the one I'm going to upload to the board. Let me just move this over a little bit. Right, let's uh, let's see what it says. Off you go. Upload. Compiling. Now remember it takes a little bit longer with this shield, but as it's a tiny sketch it shouldn't take too long. And it says, done. It says I've uploaded this sketch and it's tiny, it looks only 8%. Now what? If I put the LED back in there, do we expect it to flash? So there's the LED back in, but well, it's not flashing, is it? And of course it won't because the reset pin isn't yet a GPIO pin. So now what you've got to do is take it out of here, put it back into that board and say, now I want it as a GPIO pin. And then it will flash. Let's do that. Right, so here we are then back at the programming board and we want to enable that RS, um, the GPI pin and disable the RST pin. So that's a number two this time. So we enter two, uh, press enter, off it goes. That's ready as DF. Yeah, we want it as 5F, correct. I said that as well. And uh, then it's reread it back and it says, yes, it definitely is 5F now. So what can we expect? Well, basically we're expecting that the pin one physical pin one the old rst pin is now in fact going to be a proper io pin let's turn that 12 volt power supply off right let me plug all this back in and uh, it should start flashing that led as long as i get the uh, the chip the right way around so that goes in there plug that in oh look at that it started to flash that little double blink so that proves really doesn't it that um, it's all working now what's the caveat here apart from all this faffing about 
putting chips in and out which is okay it seems a bit of a faff here because we're trying to you know demo it in real life you probably would test it once then switch it off so it's an rst pin so you can carry on proging and uploading your um, sketches well the the spec sheet says this is a weak gpio pin because pin one has to stand the 12 volts that we've got on here which we'll talk about in just a sec um, that enables us to do all this fuse writing so what do we mean by weak well it really is weak if you consider that a standard gpio pin will either sink or source around about 20 milliamps of current with no trouble at all uh, this one you're talking about a tenth of that if that so although it's flashing this particular LED, because this is a very, very low current LED indeed, it's indeed it's a hyper bright one, and it takes about, I think it's like two milliamps or something. But uh, although it looks okay on camera, uh, in real life it's, well, it's not bad, actually it's not bad, but if you ever wanted to do any more than just flash a little LED like this, you would have to plug it into a board like this, so that we're driving it with a transistor so let's uh, let's do that and just look at the difference shall we and here's a circuit diagram of a typical current amplifier so basically pin one of the transistor here perhaps via a transistor um, a resistor um, will drive an led or anything else you want now in this mock-up that i've got down here the one you're seeing on the bench there i haven't actually put a resistor in but I don't think I'd probably keep it like that as sort of a, a real circuit because even though the spec sheet says you only get a couple of milliamps out of pin one, you only want a little tiny surge for a fraction of a second. And you could be asking this to conduct an awful lot of current through here. So um, a low value, you know, 100 ohms up to a K, best to try it out really. Right, so there we are. The output pin is now driving this transistor here. A simple little transistor and I think even you can see on the camera that it's a lot lot brighter um, because there's more current available to it so you get about a milliamp or maybe two one and a half something like that out of pin one here and that's not a problem you can always enhance that and uh, amplify the current as we're doing here whether it's driving LEDs or indeed I don't know, switches motors who whatever it is you're doing uh, it's not an issue but you do have to remember it's a weak output pin let's talk about the board itself that you can see in the background here what about this board how easy is it to do and um, well is it worth it right let's talk about the actual programming board then that's this thing that i've built on strip board here that plugs into any uno size board now i've enhanced this a little bit compared to the original circuit just because i felt it would be useful and also it would help stability of the board so they fit in here now as you know the uno has got a strange sort of gap in the pin arrangement here no, i've no idea why they did that and here as well it just makes things very awkward doesn't it but um, i found that just by leaving a gap on this strip board and then angling the pins a little bit it fits absolutely fine not only that um, it actually adds a bit of stability so that's that's very stable once it's in there because it's, it's connected with more pins and it means I have an extra three pins then to do stuff with. So what I've done is um, turn on an LED down here and have a little beeper here that tells me when things are running and when they're finished. Okay, well that's, that's how the board plugs into the Uno and the sketch we had a very brief look at. We're not really too worried about the sketch. What about the circuit though for this? How easy with this? Well, the answer is very, quite frankly. This is the, um, the underlying article I found, and there's, there's several like this on the internet, all basically the same. Uh, let's have a look at the circuit diagram, which is simplicity itself. There's the circuit diagram look. That's easy enough to understand, isn't it? Where you just connect all these things in nicely in sequence to those pins on the Arduino. That's what makes it useful. You can just plug it in. And you've got one transistor here, and you've got this 12 volt supply here. Now, lots of people on the internet saying, oh, I can't be bothered 12 volt supply. I put in a, a buck boost converter or just have a little socket and plug in a 12 volt supply when I need it. But I thought, mm, I don't know, I just, I just fancy something a bit more permanent than that, really. So as you can see here, 
I have a 12 volt battery holder. These are the sort of um, batteries you get in um, car remote fobs, you know, for your central locking. That's that battery. A23, I think it is. Is that what it says on it? Yeah, it's an A23S 12 volt. There we are. So it's, it's a reasonable size, fits on here. The other thing is that I definitely wasn't going to use a socket like this to put it in and out because I have enough trouble getting it in and out of the one on the shield here. That's bad enough. And yes, I do have a, a pin puller that we, one of these, one of these chip pullers in fact, that works well enough, but it's still a lot of faffing about. And I thought, no, if I'm going to do it, let's do it right. So I've got a, a ZIF socket here. Now you can't get an eight pin ZIF but you can get a 14 pin where the top three pins and the bottom four pins are sort of separated by that little, little raised piece of plastic there. So what I'll probably do, I'll probably put a little piece of card over those first three just to make sure I never accidentally plug anything. That's why I've got these pin numbers on here, one, four, five and eight. So we plug it into the bottom half. Uh, the only difference to the circuit, I've put um, a little tiny capacitor here for the power just to smooth anything out because the power is supplied from pin eight down here. And as I said, I've put a beeper in over the, on these pins and I've put a, an LED on as well and a switch. So this switch with that LED um, supplies power now to pin one over here. This transistor then drags that down to ground so it can make a pulse. Let's look at the circuit and uh, describe it in a bit more detail there. So what happens is the the pulse is given down this wire here, D13. As that is turned on, it sinks this 12 volt supply that's supplied from this battery in a 1K resistor to pin one. It sinks that down to ground. So pin one goes temporarily down to ground, kadunk, and then back up again to give it a pulse on pin one, which is enough then for the fuse writing process to work. And the fuse writing then uses all these other pins here. And uh, one more, yeah, it's D12, there we are. So between them, these pins here plus that, and of course you've got power on D8 and ground on pin four. All that is enough to get that working. Now, was it simple to put together? It, I think it would have been simpler wiring wise if I had used one of these, but I wasn't gonna use one of these for the reasons I've already stated. So by putting a fairly large ZIF socket in, I sort of um, didn't have room for these wires to go in a nice straight line anymore. But um, I mean, it will do, I mean, it's okay, isn't it? Um, I don't really wanna show the underneath, a bit of a mess, but it's okay. I mean, it's strip board, isn't it? You're never gonna get it nice and tidy. Now, in fact, funnily enough, um, the chap who has supplied this shield here, um, Themis, his name was, if you remember, I mean, he could take a circuit like this, turn this into a, a nice little printed circuit board, probably half the size with a ZIF socket and everything else. And the wiring would be, well, simplicity itself, or I should say the, the, the tracking would be very simple for a, a printed circuit board. But for a, you know, a strip board, that's fair enough. And it's, it's not difficult to get this far once you've got the circuit in front of you like that. In fact, they do suggest an easier way of doing it here. Look. So this is probably the very simplest method of doing it. Um, it's not the best picture I've seen. I mean, that is a resistor there. Links are obvious. Breaks are these little cuts. Now, normally you don't break strip wire like that, strip board. You actually have a little tool that I use. It's a handheld tool with a sort of a well, it's a bit like a drill bit on the end. And if you haven't got the tool, you do use a drill bit. I use a drill bit for years. Um, and it just makes these little circular holes. But as you can see, it's on an actual hole itself. So not quite like this one's laid out. Basically, there was no room in here to put a break if you're going to build it like this. So this would actually have to be a little bit longer to accommodate the breaks. But whatever, if you, if you think you can do this, or it's something you want, then I don't suppose it's going to be too much of a hindrance, frankly. And in fact, look, he's built his here, plugged into the same side, exactly the same as I have. I mean, that's probably why these pins are chosen in this order. Well, almost definitely when you think about it. Otherwise, it's not going to work, is it? So, yeah, so that's that. So as I'm saying, I'm using a few more pins. I'm using seven, six and five. 
just for the, uh, the the bottom end of my stuff so I can have a beeper and another light on it. Obviously you don't have to do that. You can avoid this entirely if you want. Take those out of the equation, that LED out of the equation. It just becomes a little bit simpler to wire up then. But um, I fancied the, the switch and the LED for the 12 volt supply and the, the um, actual holder for it because this is now permanent fixture isn't it? I can get this out at any time and everything's where you want it and the battery won't go flat because I've got a nice bright LED to tell me when it's on and that should last for absolutely years as long as well, think how long the battery lasts in your remote control fob for your car I mean that's probably at least two years isn't it and using that every day so I won't be using this every day and a zip socket of course just means you can just plug in a, a chip in there and then just put down the handles and ping it up and the thing falls out again brilliant so that's the board a proper DIY board if you like and I like the fact that it um, plugs into the Arduino Uno on its uh, side like that. I like the fact that you know you can just plug it in like that and it's it's you know no wires or anything because I don't think you'd do it if it was too faffing about just plugging it in like that though means yeah great I can reprogram an 80 tiny 85 fuse bit anytime I like. So that's that. Um, Apart from that, on the web, let's have a look. There's this embedded fuse calculator that um, I mentioned. Here we are. I'll put all these links, of course, in the video below. So this is, um, this is, is it from Atmel? No, it's not. It's actually embedded.com, but it is an Atmel AVR fuse calculator. So you pick your chip, and of course, it's got loads and loads in there. So for an AT Tiny 85, this is how it comes out of the factory, I think, basically. And what we're doing is saying reset disabled. That's the one we're resetting. So enable PB5 as an IO pin. Hooray, that's the bit we want. And what happens is, if you can look down here, we just get it on screen, look, that's good. Uh, right down the bottom, this is the, the low fuse, which we're not particularly interested in at this stage because we're not changing anything else on here. The high fuse is currently DF. Okay, now if we, if we um, click that little thing in there, and now it comes into 5F, which is the value you need if you want to use it as an I.O. pin. And that little board will unset that back to DF. Now, look, there are some other values you can set on here, like brownout detector and things like that. But that wasn't the purpose of this board. And I don't think I'll probably be setting other, any other fuses, to be quite honest, on here. Right, this could be um, useful just to make a note of this. This is the reset pin output voltage versus source current. Now, this is VCC 3 volts. Now, we're not using 3, we're using 5. But as you can see, the, the current down here is minuscule compared to the 20 milliamps you might expect for other pins. So, in fact, if we scroll up here to other pins, here we are. This is sort of standard, really, for VCC 5 volts. Um, you can see the output here, 25 degrees, room temperature that is, um, 20 milliamps, no trouble at all. So the 1 to 2 milliamps out of that reset pin is most definitely a weak GPIO, so just bear that in mind. Right, I think that is it then. So we've proven, without a shadow of a doubt, you can have six GPIO pins on your AT Tiny 85. There's just that little bit of faffing about getting it from a GPIO pin back to a reset pin. But then if you organise your sketch correctly, you probably only have to do that a few times until your sketch is 100%. That's made it an awful lot more useful to me having six GPIO pins now because you can do a lot more with six, can't you? I mean, when I think about my fridge alarm downstairs, which I changed actually from an eight pin pick to a umpteen pin nano, it's ridiculous that it's using a nano to determine whether the, the um, fridge door is open or not and sound an alarm. The AT Tiny with six GPIO pins could do that easily. Not that I'm going to change it now, of course, it's all a bit late, but it's the sort of project that you could easily use a, a Tiny in. And of course, remember that the power consumption of a Tiny uh, can be Tiny as well, depending on what speed you're running at. I explained all this in the video last time, so I won't repeat that again now. But there we are. That's it then. I think we're all done and dusted with this one. Six GBIO pins on your AT Tiny 85. All you've got to do is set that fuse bit every now and again, depending on what you're doing. But I think that makes it a surefire winner. Okay. Thanks very much for watching. Remember, give me a thumbs up if you like it. There's information down below. And uh, see you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. 
There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.